Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lee, and I'm thrilled to welcome Megan Duhamel to join us to discuss the Grand Prix assignments for the upcoming season. Megan, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Dave. Yes. I have my coffee. I brought like a special mug. Oh, because good. I usually collect Starbucks mugs, but I got this made during COVID. Oh, I love the one with all the off ice. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Very it's still good. like with all the off ice for me, but it was like really relevant in 2020. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, like, I actually sometimes look back, like, nostalgically at that point in time, like, in certain ways, like, the simplicity of just, like, getting up and working out was nice, but obviously, like, the everybody world. did it. I was telling my three-year-old about that. She likes to, for me to tell her stories. So wow. I was telling her about, like, when she was a baby and we couldn't go anywhere. And she's like, was I sad? And I was like, well, you were, like, six months old, so not really. Um but yeah, it's just like, it's funny also for like people of like different ages are going to look back on this in different ways. Plus like when you're working out multiple times a day, like what do they say in Legally Blonde? Like exercise gives you endorphins, endorphins make you happy and happy people don't kill their husbands. So it was okay <laughs> during, during, during all the You have time to go to Starbucks already? No, oh, I did. I did Uber Eats. So it's oh. 645 and we are filming the Grand Prix assignments. So I, I, I thought like, how can I get up, shower and be ready? So yes. Okay. Good for you. Yeah. I well, fed my baby and rolled out of bed. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to be efficient. Okay. So let's discuss the Grand Prix assignments. Because yesterday you had a really interesting point of view about Canada and how they're not using their TVDs. And when I saw the Grand Prix assignments, all I did was see like a sea of TBDs. So I think we need a discussion about how like some TBDs are good and some TBDs are bad because people are going to say, why is a TBD good in some cases and not others? So discuss the TBD and how it is typically used. Yeah. So like... I see what you mean with all the empty spots. Like China has left almost all their spots empty. So yeah. has Finland, who's not used to hosting a Grand Prix and having three host spots to send skaters. So I get their, their decision. And when I look at the USA's um, TBD spots, they're looking at maximizing events for their skaters, mm -hmm. even just for the pairs. Emily and Spencer and Danny and Ella are not going to skate America because they were guaranteed two events elsewhere. So they want to, U.S. wants to maximize the number of skaters that they can get out on the international circuit. So I get it. I agree with it. I think it's extremely smart. Um, you know, U.S. skating, like whether it's as popular as it used to be or not, there is a lot of successful skaters right mm -hmm. now. Like you have world champions, you have international medalists. Um, we don't have so much of that in Canada. So mm -hmm. I think that the USFSA is doing the right thing by trying to get as many skaters as possible out internationally. I agree 100%. We look at Canada's side where we have no TBDs. Mm -hmm. um, if I recall correctly, we had no, no TBDs. We named everybody. What if a new pair team appears this summer and they're really freaking good? Mm -hmm. They don't have the opportunity to go, but there's a pair team at Skate Canada that was guaranteed two events elsewhere. So they could have had two events somewhere else, kept a TBD spot for a new team that might appear this summer. Um, same with the ladies, you know, here we have Fiona again being left with nothing. Why not leave a TBD, see who does better this summer, Sarah Mode or Fiona? And if Sarah Mode does better, I'll let her have the spot. What was the rush to name all of these, these spots? That's what I don't understand. Um, so I'm all for the TPDs, like in contrast to you, who that was extremely frustrating for you. Well, I think that some TPDs are good. I mean, typically in the U.S., we've always had the third spot at Skate America in all disciplines be the TPD, and it encourages skaters to do the summer competitions, which yeah. I also think is a good thing, especially for an up and coming skater. They may not be planning on competing at the world championships. So getting to compete in the summer and then compete for that spot is usually really beneficial. Um, and th sometimes they do really well, sometimes they don't, but it, it's just kind of how it works. I think when I see all of the TBDs across the board is where I start worrying about um, the field. And I think the TBDs that really shook me was China, um, mm -hmm. who doesn't actually have the skaters currently in their pipeline to fill those host spots. And I think that that's something that the ISU should then start to look at when you when they know, right, that they don't have the certain pairs or certain skaters to do it. And in the past, one of the things that 
they used to do, I think through 2003, 2004, was that skaters could do a third Grand Prix assignment as if you were in the top six. So if you were in the top six, you got the option to do a third one. You could get an appearance fee, you could get prize money. And then it allows for more head to head matchups. And I think when we're low on skaters, because there's a ban going on and there's also just rebuilding of pairs in general, I think it would be really beneficial to do that. I agree. It actually went like further than that. I think that they stopped it around like 2003, 2004, and then they brought it back. And then in 2011, um, I was seventh at Worlds, but um, Caitlin and John had finished sixth and and they weren't skating anymore. So we kind of got bumped up to that seated spot. And I was like, oh, we got a third Grand Prix. It's extra prize money. It was really exciting. Um, and then they took that away. Oh. So I never got to like live that, but I think that was a great opportunity um, for skaters. And you didn't have to do it. You had the option. I remember one year, oh. And it also- I It must've been to- that year. There was one year- that Alion and Robin had a third event and they'd had a really bad Grand Prix season. And the last event was Russia. It was their bonus event and they went, but by going, they bumped somebody down a spot and we qualified for the final. Incredible. Um, And I remember at the Grand Prix final, Ingo told Eric and I, you're welcome. You know that it, because we went to Russia, it's why you're here. <laughs> uh, so like mathematically things happen too, when somebody can go to that third spot. Yeah, and just to specify for those people who don't remember, the third spot, you would designate it ahead of time as a non-scoring. But why I like it, especially right now, is like we're trying to build stars in the sport. We had so many big retirements of Yuzuru Hanyu, Nathan Chen, skaters that were around forever. And I think it allows you to play with the matchups on the Grand Prix. And then skaters are slightly less afraid of going against each other if there's not that risk of getting bumped down for the final. So I actually was super nerdy and wrote out like potential matchups. But if I were the USFS, I would try to encourage Shoma Uno to come to Skate America. That way you could have the US national champion against the world champion. Now they're ranked number one, number three in the world that wouldn't, or from the world championships, that wouldn't necessarily usually happen. But in this case, it would be much easier to do that. And then you can really kind of play and actually have Madison Chalk against Piper Gillis and Paul Poirier and allow them to go head to head and really kind of create things both for crowds and TV, because I think that they need to really encourage um, that within the sport. And like we used to have that. We used to have skaters like at least from the same country going to the same event, um, yeah. even to like I was speaking for pairs, but I was like, oh, too bad. Like Trent and Leah didn't go to skate Canada. Um, and then like they left a TBD and sent the other pairs somewhere else who were guaranteed events. Um, and Bruno was like, well, I'm sure they just didn't want to compete against each other. And I was like, yeah, but why not? Like that makes everybody better. Yeah. And it, it doesn't mean it's true. I'm just like sharing a story, like of speculation. It doesn't mean it's true, but I agree with you about having these like matchups. TV likes that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do them at like, I hate to say it, but like the, the bigger Grand, Grand Prix. Prix events, the more popular Grand Prix events um, that have like bigger TV networks and, and whatnot. But watch, I say that and like Finland's going to have like a huge following. Or but typically, like that. Um, I'm the third Grand Prix event has always kind of been the dip, right? You yeah. have because it, you have it like, used to be the Cup of China, Cup right? Of China. And then it was um, Nations Cup uh, before that. So it's always kind of been the dip, right? Like the top skaters would go to Typically the Grand Prix would start in the US and Canada and the top skaters would go to those two events. I yeah. think that you could really kind of play with it because if I were France, I would want Kevin and Adam to compete against each other as often as possible because they're both really good and it promotes that competitiveness between them. And it allows- And they have to go against each other eventually anyways. By Europeans, they will be against each other. So why not just start it? And ultimately it builds both skaters and it builds- um, you know, interest within the country yeah. and it allows more people to get into skating because you want to see that as a viewer. Uh, absolutely. Also, and that's what, I mean, that's what makes the skaters better at the end of the day. Um, I know everyone, you said that you wouldn't want to compete against each other, but then you said they make it better. If you lose that matchup, right? Like if we look at historically, Tara Lipinski lost 97 Skate America to Michelle Kwan. She still won the Olympics. It, you know, mm-hmm. like it just was a step. One event. Yeah. It's one event. And every event you learn, every competition you learn, you make adjust. If you're smart, you make the adjustments that are needed. Yeah. Uh, 
like the last season we skated together, we wanted Skate Canada. Like we always did Skate Canada. We wanted Skate Canada and then the last event because there was like a good spacing between them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when Skate Canada was at the like the meeting to pick the events, they called our coach mm-hmm. and um, they told Bruno like, do Megan and Eric want to switch to China? China's an easier event. Um, going to Skate Canada, we had Aliona, Vanessa and Morgan, Dylan and Lubov who had beat us at Worlds the year before, like so many teams. Mm-hmm. And we were like, no, we still want to go to Skate Canada. Because we, we have to compete against these people anyways. So why not just do it earlier in the season? And we won. We beat Aliona and, and uh, Bruno, but they still won the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it didn't mean anything in the long term, but um, it made us like push ourselves to be ready, like Olympic ready for February, yeah. because we knew we were going against these teams and making the Grand Prix final was that important. Yeah. Um, and it made everybody better because I'm sure it pushed Aliona and Bruno to work harder after losing that event because they wanted to be the champions. Mm -hmm. No, I wanted to ask you also is that we're heading into the second year in a cycle. And for some skaters, I think we're surprised people that they're continuing Piper and Paul, um, Chalk and Bates. I think the world is in Montreal this year. So not so surprised about Piper and Paul. They're the only skaters that are like top five slash medal potential. Right. And then next year they're in the U.S., which is basically like a home world for Piper anyway. So then all of a sudden you're there to 2025. Then you only have a year left to the exactly. Olympics. <laughs> so are they in it, do you think, for 2026 at this point? I'd say they are, because why not? They've already done this. They're, if they're doing Montreal, like mm-hmm. that was like kind of my thing with Keegan, too. It was like you did the extra year, then it's Montreal Worlds. And then if you do Montreal Worlds, you might as well just do another two years because you're halfway there anyways. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. And you have to think about people like Piper and Paul, they they love to skate. Mm-hmm. Right now, skating is not a sacrifice to their life. They both have like very like strong, like successful personal lives for so long, so many years. Paul was even working at the university after he finished graduating. Um, so, I mean, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not a sacrifice. It's not setting back their life post skating. I, I don't see why they wouldn't continue. I think everyone just wonders if, you know, Madison or Piper wants to have kids. Obviously that's, you know, what the time, but I think for right now. It, they're it's, still so young. Yeah. Like we, they might've been around for a long time because they started like this on the scene when they were younger, but mm-hmm. They're pretty young in the general scheme of things. They're not 35, 36, 40 years old. Now, how about your body and health? Because you were a para skater, which is different than dance. Obviously, you have different impacted injuries. How did your body handle the last quad? And I was wondering, like, what your psychological energy level was like going back, you know, for that last year. Like, when did you get, did you ever get, like, emotionally or psychologically tired through that period? probably like the year before the Olympics, like our, our really crappy season. <laughs> we both yeah. like psychologically and emotionally, like a little bit burnt out. Yeah. Um, but my body was like in the best shape ever by then. I had learned how to train properly and how to manage my body, how to take care of it, the right treatments, what treatments I needed every day. Um, so my body had like a never- knee and a foot thing going on. Like, didn't you- Well, like, of, yeah. So I had like, the issue with like, I had a piece of bone, like kind of moving around my foot. I think Madison Chalk had the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And she had surgery to like remove the the piece of bone. What I did was I just stopped doing toe loops and put a sow cow in my program and the pain just, I didn't have to deal with it because I didn't have to pick for a triple toe. Okay. Um, But uh, I think that like, at some point you are going to like emotionally and psychologically kind of like hit Mm -hmm. that low. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we were riding a high after the Olympic season in Sochi because we went undefeated. And then the next season we won worlds again. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were like on the up and up and up, but then like, eventually there's nowhere to go, but down. Mm -hmm. We were up so high that the only place that we could go was to dip a bit and and build back up. But um, I mean, by that point, it was like, I remember after Boston worlds talking to Bruno and being like, it's never going to get better. Like, why would I keep skating? It's never going to be better than this. I'm never going to skate better. I'm never going to have a better experience. Like this was the ultimate lifetime experience. Why would I keep going? Um, and he was like, well, first you're winning a lot of money. (laughs) You had to think about that. Um, and second, it was like, you're halfway to the Olympics. Now you just have two more years to go like one more year till the Olympic season. You've already done these last two years. Why not just finish the next two? And at that point, it was like, yeah, I like it. I guess so. You seemed so energetic at that time that I couldn't have imagined you stopping. 
No, I guess like, I just like had a moment where I was super tired, um, probably yeah. coming home from tour and like, you need to start getting ready for the next season and like a little bit burnt out. And I would go through like twice a year, like get like a really like bad, like burnout couple days. Um, especially because I gave like 200% all the time. So I did hit that wall and I was always aware, like, mm -hmm. oh, it's just like my bad week of the year. I know it's like, I get it every year. I've been doing too much. I need to hold back a little bit, but, um, I did have those thoughts and it was mostly like, it's never going to be this good. So why would I keep skating if I'm never going to be as good as I just was? Because I really felt like in my soul that that was my capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, yeah, it was very interesting, but again, it was, we were 2016. We were two years to the Olympics. I went through those two years, might as well to put myself in a position that I could win a medal at the Olympics. I did all of that. Why not finish it off, finish the journey. And the weird thing is that that fall I visited you and you two were training really well. And then the Grammy season did not go well. Uh, but when I was skating, it didn't look like there were any problems that were about to start you know happening so that's mm -hmm. just... I mean there was no like huge problem it was just yeah. like little things and feeling pressure and being tired and yeah. Eric having like a lot of injuries and and things like that but it was like nothing like huge. major but when little things add up here and there it throws yeah. you off your game like not yeah. having like even coming down to not having the best programs mm -hmm. throws you off right because then you're not as confident in what you're doing and mm -hmm. Yeah, I ask it because we look at Kaori Sakamoto and Sho Udo and they both are coming in as two-time defending world champions and they're from Japan where skating is super popular and that's also exciting and adds a lot of pressure. So I was wondering what you kind of are expecting for Shoma this season. I mean, and they just had worlds in Japan. They just so had like worlds in Japan. Like talking about like maybe like coming down from your high a little bit, <laughs> that would be what they would be yeah. experiencing I imagine or the summer of it the thing is that they just like jump right into all these shows and tours and all these things so do they ever have a moment to just stop and like ah uh, like really reflect on all the things that have happened to them and like come up with a really good game plan to move forward in the right direction or like has the ball just kept on rolling and rolling and rolling and eventually it's gonna roll out of control well, um, was injured so right so we haven't yeah, seen he was you're right yeah. so, but I mean like we saw Kaori, like she wasn't that great all season going into Worlds. No. She struggled a little bit. Um, she wasn't as sharp. She wasn't as consistent this season. So I'd say like she kind of hit a bit of a low, but she was still having great results because mm -hmm. the rest of the field just wasn't as strong. So I think it's a little bit of a different situation. Yeah, I think for Kaori, by and large, I'm expecting her to be a more consistent this season. It seemed like she was adjusting to being in that position plus having the post Olympics. So I would expect and like trying a different style, yeah. like different things. Shoma, I'm more concerned about. It just seems like it took a lot for him to become more consistent and win and then win again and become injured. And what is going to happen this season with him, especially with the injury. But I, I'm, cu I'm curious because Yuma Kagiyama will be back and we're going to see the two of them on the Grand Prix. I don't know how it works that he got two events. So like in pairs, you have the split couple rule. What's mm -hmm. the singles rule that you can like miss two seasons, but still be on the list to get events? Or he didn't miss two no, seasons. He, he only missed one, one season. One. And he was. If Did he, he go somewhere this season to get a season best score? No. he Does only he need a season best score. Week. Or be tough. Don't they count it for the last two years, right? So the season's best. So you season can have... best score is two years long. Yeah. So he went to the Olympics. Okay. He he medaled. I thought it was only a one year thing. That's why I was like a little bit confused. Brain fart on my part. Well, it's definitely like you can have the minimum for two years to go to Worlds, right? So it counts yeah. for the season before. So yeah. Okay. You can have the minimum score, but does that mean that you can? Like your score carries over season by season to be selected. I guess this is the answer. Yes, it does. I didn't know. I didn't know for singles that that did that. So. Which obviously we're all happy it did because we want to see more Yuma. Um, yes. Love him. And he was working with Shay Lynn and he's probably going to have some good programs and hopefully he's healthy and he's taken the right decision to like take the time to take care of himself so he can be ready for the next Olympics. Yes. And he... He said that he has his quad flip back, so he can do quad toe, quad tau, quad loop. Quad... And I think he was just really coming into his own as a big personality. And then it was almost. I loved him at the Olympics. Yeah. Like, 
I loved the smile short program when he did not smile because I'm not too sure that he understood. Um, I loved, I loved it all. He was like my find. It was super disappointing when he couldn't take what he built there last season and allow it to flourish. Um, but I think now, you know, he's stepped back and he's going to reappear and hopefully have that moment. Yeah. I'm excited to see him. And what do you think about Jun Cha? We just heard yesterday that he is not going to be working with Brian Orser anymore. Um, he hasn't, I haven't read exactly what he's doing. If he's just staying with his current coaches in Korea, I believe he's worked with them more since COVID. So maybe it's easier just to stay. What were your kind of thoughts on that? Well, he hasn't been in Toronto for years, right? Brian just really goes to events yeah. with him and Brian goes to Korea, I think, to visit him from time to time. But um, disappointing. I, mm. I mean, I'd like to think that if I was a skater, I'd want Brian and Tracy by my side. Um, mm. I think that they'd be a great tool uh, in a, you know, in a competition and a kiss and cry and a post skating analysis and many, many things. So kind of a loss there. Um, I appreciate everything he does. Mm -hmm. I have never really been like that sold on his material and his skating. Um, so I'm curious what, what he's going to do to allow his skating to grow, not just technically, but with some programs with this personality, which I think he has the potential to do some really unique programs. Um, and he just hasn't taken that, that opportunity quite yet. Um, so I'm really curious how he's, he's going to grow on that side. Mm -hmm. I haven't jumped on the bandwagon yet though. I jumped on the bandwagon for his quads last year. Both the toe and sow were such high quality. And I remember yeah. Belinda at Worlds, like listing the bullets for them. And like more speed coming out of that quad sow sometimes than he had going in. Like I see the yeah. greatness in that, like the skill in that. But, but then the triple axle where he waits way too long to uh, take off. That's still my concern because I don't know if he's going to fix that. And like some of the QE landings. Okay. <laughs> my thing, but I appreciate everything he does. Yeah. I just, I'm much more um, of a Yuma fan. Like we just talked about Yuma. So like if I'm choosing between the two. Now, how about Ilya Malinin? He came off last season. He did do the quad axle. He had some consistency issues up and down, some injuries. What's your take on him going into this season? I mean... <laughs> I find them entertaining. I'm I, entertained yes. by all the quads. I am. Yes. Um, I hope that he is going to get some really great choreography this season. I would love to see him work with a Shaylin. I don't know if he has choreography done or he said. Yes, he, he yeah. worked with Shaylin. Yes. Well, At least yeah, I, love it the already. I love it. I foresaw the future mm -hmm. that already happened. <laughs> um, I, I do think that Shaylin might be able to draw something out of him in the way that she was able to do that with Nathan. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm looking forward to that development, but I hope he keeps doing the quad axle because after Worlds, he said something about like, he's not going to focus on the quad axle because he's going to focus on his components, but then he's been doing the quad axle all over social media. Um, I'm all for it. I think it's great. I think it makes something exciting. It makes him stand out in the field. You need, every skater needs something that allows them to stand out. And he has found that niche. Now he's, he can, use that to propel him as high as he can in the standings while he works on everything else. Um, so I'm all for it. I, I hope that the USFSA keeps on, on pushing him and promoting him. Um, I'm all for Ari and his comments about the quad axle, not getting what it's worth. I mean, not because I like necessarily agree. It does get a bucket load of points, the quad mm -hmm. axle. Um, but I love how it's just like creating some sort of talk and spice in skating. <laughs> Well, I think in general, the big elements should be worth more points. We talked about, you know, the quad throws uh, yeah. being reduced in point value. And I would agree with that. Listen, if you're doing a quad axle, you can get as many points as you want. I, I, I would also, love him to do the quad axle in the short for a combination. Oh. Um, that's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see that this year. I was hoping last year when he was having all those trouble in the short program that he would just go for that. Um, but he never did. That would be fun. Some of his other regular quads, we had some cueish landings last season from time to time. So it might benefit him to do the quad axle, especially. That's what I was thinking. His quad toe was like a little bit inconsistent there for a while. While well, the quad axle, even though the, the quality might not have been at a plus five, it was still really fairly consistent there for a couple months of competition. 
And because there was so much buzz in the quad axle and it was a new element, he's probably doing it more than he was doing the other quads. And so, I mean, he's so young. So like, imagine his energy, like he's getting all hyped up about it. I don't know. I think yeah. it's fun. I think that it really um, is his year to move ahead or not, right? And that he has to be consistent. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. He has to show a little bit more consistency and a little bit more, um, maturity is not the right word, but a little bit more charisma in his performances energy into his performances um so it's not just like he's walking through the performance until he gets to the footwork I, mm. I think that that's what he needs to focus on this year which yeah. I think Shaylin is perfect okay so for Skate America we have Kevin Amos who always has ups and downs it's very entertaining to watch uh, you don't know what's going to happen Shun Sato uh, Dennis Vasiliev Ilya Malinin and then Naumov uh, Maxim Naumov and Andrew Torgashev who were both super good at nationals and super inconsistent last season afterwards so I think for both of them they need to really um step it up we have Vladimir um Litvinitsev and Stephen Gogolev. At this point, what do you make of Stephen Gogolev? We have seen highs and lows and potential. And what is the latest? Yeah. I mean, we saw Skate Canada give him another chance by sending him to World Team Trophy. Mm -hmm. Don't agree with that decision because he has shown up competition after competition and really showed a lackluster effort. Mm -hmm. Not you don't at the skate well after at every competition i get it i get having bad competitions i get having a bunch of bad competitions in a row trust me i did it but when you're just going and doing double sows and double toes and kind of like oh hum energy i mean that's a sign that maybe you're not interested in what you're doing that's a sign of troubling training mm. um because if you do that in competition what are you doing in training it would be even it the other end of the spectrum, it's even worse probably in training. So I think that if he's going to keep going, he needs some to be shaken up and have some changes put into place. I was a big fan of him when he was younger. And like, I'd still like to see him obviously be successful, but he seems so disinterested, so disconnected. Um, I don't understand. I don't understand what's going on there at all. I don't understand why he got world team trophy. I don't understand right now why he's still skating he seems so uninterested by it he doesn't seem to be enjoying what he's doing at all mm. yeah so I'm, I'm very confused by the whole thing I would say that you talked about Ilya needing to add charisma he's needed to do this for a long time he's worked with Shaylin he has he had the great music he had the great yeah. music and opportunity this year um with his Shaylin program to do it but I think he needs to add that in I think for him it's now or never, right? He needs That's to the thing though. Like say, so we can compare them. Ilya has like some intensity, like he yes. wants to do it. When he doesn't compete well, he's clearly disappointed. Yeah. He goes for it. He goes for everything where mm -hmm. you have like the other end, Gogo doesn't even like give the effort to, to attempt his jumps half the time. So I think that the, the effort, the energy is, is very clear between the two. They both need to work on the performance aspect, but Ilya at least is giving an effort into the, the performances and the things that he can do right now. He just needs to have more to give an effort into in the performance area. Yeah, I think, and is he still working with Raphael for part of the year? Because I know he would go back and forth. That's I always have no idea what he does, actually, to be honest. He had that assistant of Raphael at events. I never know his name, but that man that was at all Go Go's events. Yes. Um, Raph didn't go to any of his events, I, as I recall. Yeah, and Raph does a thing where he doesn't necessarily, he tries to motivate the skaters by when they're working hard enough to get to a certain level, then he's yeah. going to come in. Otherwise, he's going to be semi retired. But then it, I think if someone isn't super motivated and doesn't, you know, it doesn't work for everyone, that thing, sometimes they slack off yeah. more. So, yes. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like Go Go like, needs like, some sort of like nur like encouraging nourishment um okay. probably like almost to be like i say this in a positive way like to be like babied a little bit more kind of like mariah in what she said that she needed adam for okay like i feel like he needs like some sort of figure like that yeah adam's on tv right now um in mars but when he's back maybe we could call him again <laughs> i think he is is he he's actually in mars no they went no no one's been to mars but uh, he's in um 
they they were a show that was filmed in Australia, but it was in the outback to make it look okay. like they were on the surface of Mars. And okay. Well, that, I was like, wait a second, you said that so seriously. No, like, it's the most ridiculous. Possible. It's the most ridiculous reality show that we've seen in a long time. Oh, so he's on a reality show. Yes, where okay. it is called the Stars on Mars. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and then William Shatner is giving them the thing. And he's like with Real Housewives and yeah. It's, okay. And Lance Armstrong is there. Okay. So at Skate Canada, we have Wesley Chu, who he has been up and coming for several seasons and been more consistent, although he struggled uh, at the end of the season last year. Conrad Orzel and Roman Sadovsky. So what is your take on the Canadian men here? I don't know what, like what Roman is doing. I think he's been in Japan judging from his Instagram and what I've heard. Okay. Uh, so I know like as much of that as all of you do. Um, Wesley does have a lot of potential. Big fan of, of Wesley. He seems to work really hard. Kind of got lost last year a little bit. I think maybe feeling the pressure of going to senior competition. And he had a really good season the year before at the Canadian Nationals. So hopefully that fate, like we've shifted from that phase and he's going to be a little bit more confident um, in moving forward this way I think that he's somebody that could also benefit from some more performance energy in his programs mm -hmm. maybe testing out some different choreographers um that could help him do that mm -hmm. um like you know giving like a little bit more of an outward energy and I think that that might be the missing link if he focused on that it might take some pressure off of the jumps and he'll find his feet on those jumps a little bit better without overthinking them mm -hmm. yeah Roman, I really am not sure what to make of this. Yeah. Again, I think for him, it is now or never. Yeah. But I always watch his vlogs and you wait for what he's going to say after the competition. And it was unclear what, what his state was. Although we have seen him working more quad toes, at least posting more videos of quad toes. But it's seems unclear right but he seems motivated but it doesn't it's unclear if they've solved whatever the issues were in the past so i'm not sure if they like are aware of like mm. can pinpoint what the issue is because it always seems to come back to the comments being like well i don't do this at home in training i i train really well mm -hmm. so i'm not sure if they've actually like pinpointed the actual issue or not mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm waiting to see that uh, this season. Yeah. I know that he went to Marie France to get uh, a program okay. or two done. So uh, interested to see what that's going to look like. Um, there's Mark Gordnitsky, Matteo Rizzo, who had a good season um, last year, Kaomura and Kazuki from Japan. So those are, f and Soda Yamamoto. So Japan is three top. Yeah. Most of the events, if you're looking at the, the men or the women's competition, it's like Japan has the three yeah. spots in each event. I mean, it's going to be incredibly challenging to make the Japanese world team this season. Uh, should everyone stay healthy? Uh, because they are really, really strong. And Kaomura was really coming on with the quads. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. See, that was a disappointing decision or disappointing to see last season how he wasn't named to the world team because he was so strong. She was so strong. I really do love building, him. building better and better and better and better. Now, how about Kazuki? Because he pulled it together last season and he was in some ways a surprise uh, person to be at Worlds. Do you think he got to do some more shows, got to do the World Team Trophy? Do you expect him to build off of that or is now there's the pressure? Hopefully he's able to build yes. off of that. That's what you always hope for. But um, when you have like seven or eight guys all going for three spots. I mean, I can't imagine what the pressure feels like in that situation. So I think it's going to come down to whoever is mentally strong enough and they have to be mentally strong all season, these Japanese single skaters, not just at nationals, not just to qualify because to qualify, it means the whole season. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be the most interesting to see who can stay the most consistent because now we're throwing Yuma back into it. Yeah. And they have Mikhail uh, Shedorov, Jun Wacha is going to be at Skate Canada, and Liam Kapekis. So between Jun, Kazuki, Soda, and Cal, I think it's going, and Mateo Rizzo, it's going to be really quite. Uh, yeah, we can't forget Mateo. 
like yeah. you never know like he's gonna throw a quad loop or um have amazing amazing programs or whatever he's such a great skater so we never want to forget him like in the conversation for medals at any event because yeah. depending on the day and how he steps up he could be part of the conversation now we have france which is a little bit there's okay we have two tbds we have boyang jin who i was a little bit surprised whether or not he would keep continuing or not because yeah. Of, yeah i don't know if he's still in toronto or not i haven't heard anything i don't know but he also also had injuries before he yeah. was gone then he came then we saw him um adam uh ceo Fa from france uh obviously at the event daniel grossel from italy training with the terry um what is your take on him and what we saw last season yeah your favorite yes <laughs> No, you know what? I like was a fan of his skating. I, I like him. He's a nice boy. And that's mm -hmm. what like was the most disappointing when he made the decision to go to, mm -hmm. to, the, the, team coach, to the team of coaches that he's chosen to go to. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because like, I remember Lorenzo, his old coach, introducing me to Daniel when he was like so small and he, we were doing shows in Italy. Um, Eric and I used to do a lot of shows in Europe and he had come and introduced us like this is his skater and this boy's really good then all of a sudden I started seeing this little boy in the junior grand prix and like kind of watched him because um Lorenzo had introduced me to him but um so I think that's why like I always thought he was like a really sweet kid so this decision like became baffling to me but then I'm like well maybe I didn't really know him <laughs> I'm like basing my opinion on like the one hour I saw him in a year <laughs> um so you know what I think that making those type of decisions speaks volumes to one's moral values and it's unfortunate that the italian federation has even like agreed to that because i have to assume it's funding from the italian federation that's paying for this yeah or his police service like whatever if he's in the army or the police you know like in europe they're all part of like the army or the police or the air force valentina used to be like part of the air the air force aviation um so like funding that he's getting from italy is being given to russia i just find the whole thing a little bit okay strange. playing devil's advocate which i don't usually do do you think it's possible he doesn't know what goes on in russia no i don't think it's possible anybody that was at the olympics in beijing doesn't know what was going on in russia let alone the skaters that weren't there no i don't agree we know we have known for years it's mm -hmm. just now it has surfaced and there's truth to what we always heard so when you were a competitor, did you hear things about what was going on in Russia? Yeah, from Russians themselves sometimes, from skaters that went to Russia to train. Yeah. Because it's because I thought Alexa Kinnearum was on the Today Show and they asked her if she, she said that she was surprised she that someone was doping. And I said, we, and... And I get that this is like a morning chat show, right? But it was like, are you surprised that someone was doping? Or are you surprised that someone was caught? Because those are two very different yes. things. That, see, that is more it. Uh, yeah. Being surprised that they got caught, being surprised. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm still surprised that nothing's resolved about it. Like, do I expect more from the IOC and the ISU? How many years? I thought I did, but getting... I guess not. <laughs> Well, how many years did U.S. figure skating hire Nina Mosier? Nina Mosier, who's one of the first people to work with Dr. Shevetsky. Do you remember when your good friend, oh. Senya Stobova, best friend, right? She went, and in 2013, she did not have a very good season. She... <laughs> Let's, like, even go to, like, Sochi season. They started the season, and their clean long was getting, like, 105. And by the Olympics, this same clean long was 145, 140. Mm. Nothing changed. The program was still the same. But they went, and to get that clean long, they went to Nina, they went to Dr. Shevetsky, and it came, like, out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. I competed against them. I remember 2012, I believe, the Grand Prix in France, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was Lalique or Eric Bompard, whatever it was named at that time. Um, They, like, fell on a death spiral and had their teeny tiny double twist. And this was, like, a few years before almost winning the Olympics. Um. I also saw them after six minute warm ups going into change rooms with, I forget, I never know how to pronounce his name. But Dr. Doctor. Shevetsky. Yeah. Yeah. I saw them going into change rooms after a six minute warm up with the doctor, closing the door. And always wondered, like, what's going on in there. And then they'd come out and, like, skate so well. 
Maybe they would have skated well, even if they didn't go in that room, but you know, it gets you thinking. Who's taking their pulse. Um, then we have um, Nicola Memola. Um, there's Yuma Kagiyama, uh, Takaru. What's it Amin- called nowadays? What? What's this event called? What do they it's name it? The Grand Prix de France. Just. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lucas Bucci uh, from uh, Ilya Malinin and Camden Polkinen. So, no, I think you. Ilya might- has two events super close, which might be good if he makes the Grand Prix final. He'll have time after a second event, more time than anybody else to kind of like revamp, rebuild, rebuild anything that needs to be done. I think for Adam, he was so strong earlier in the season last year than he tried. We saw him training, uh, you know, quad flip, quad lutz. Yeah. At the end of the season, he kind of fell apart. I'm curious to see if he's going to really come out blazing uh, this season, but. He yeah. improved a lot over the years. Like he used to be so wild and out of control and, he still has that sense of out of control energy on his amazing footwork sequences. And it really works there, but he's really found a way to tame his technique and become more consistent with his jumps. Yeah. So the next week we have cup of China, three TBDs from uh, the host. Picks. Um, then we have Adam uh, going back to back. Adam going from France to China is a little tougher. Uh, you have Gabriel Frangipani, Kazuki Tomono, Shoma Uno, uh, Soda Yamamoto, Mikhail Shadarov, Siong Lee, Luca Brassard, and Jimmy Ma. So definitely more movement potential there. <laughs> they only have uh, nine guys listed. So there's certainly um, a lot that could change there. They probably haven't also, like, because China has the TBDs for everything, they probably yeah. haven't had, like, their summer competition, like whatever they do, like we in North America do our summer competitions where skaters are monitored. Um, they just probably haven't done that to monitor and look at who they want to send or they're waiting to closer to the date because skaters now in June are going to look different in September. Yeah. So maybe they're waiting as long as they can to name whoever's doing best closest to Cup of China. I know that there's been a lot of talk about the pipeline, although they did have, I think, some more skaters last year towards the very end. Waiting to see more to come, yeah. right? As they would say at work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for Finland, we have Lidensev, Ariette Lavandi, Makur Sunsev, so Kevin Amos, Nicola Memela, Matteo Rizzo, Kalmira Shunsato, Kashiro, Junwa Cha, and Andreas uh, Nurbek. Um, and then at NHK, uh, you have Mikhail Solevko. Uh, you had Daniel Grossel, Yuma Kageyama, Shoma Uno. There's one TBD for Japan, Seong Lee, Dennis Vasiliev, Luka Brucci, and Camden Polkadon. So a pretty- All the events for the men are like pretty full. Yes. I, I mean, I know we have the TBDs in China, but there's still a lot of great skaters there already. Yes. So like, they are pretty full events around the field where you have about four or five skaters <laughs> that could potentially medal at each event. Yeah. You know, what's your take on the women? So, you know, I think we're going to start to see some of the age rule change happen over the next couple of seasons. Although I don't think, I think everyone was wondering, well, how are the Russians going to do with the age rule? And they're not here. So I don't know if it impacts skaters as much as it does. Um, with Elsewhere, every- yeah. yeah. Um, so for Skate America, we have Luna Hendricks. We have Nini from China, Nina Petrokin at Motochiba, Monica Wabe, Hana Yoshida, Siong Wee, Young Yu. Um, we have Katja Kurakova, Amber Glenn, Isabel Levito, and a TBD. So with that matchup, we're kind of looking at Luna Hendricks coming into this year um, and Isabel as two of the top people. What do you think of their chances coming into this season? I think that they both have to show significant improvements if they want to really like rival Kaori on a good day. Like if Kaori is like having a really good day. Um, Luna needs to be a little bit more consistent. I'd love her to break through with a little bit different choreography or music choices maybe um I think that she has the potential to really like sparkle and perform if she's given the right material which we haven't seen yet in a competition program um and I think that Isabeau also needs to work on a little bit of that jump technique a little bit of adding that performance I feel like we're coming back to this like Mm -hmm. the performance like you know I'm thinking of the atoms of um of the skating world like mm-hmm. we were just talking talking about him earlier and how he's like really like 
calmed his energy. We don't have much of that energy in the women's event. We need um, Ashley Wagner, Moulin Rouge. Yeah. Energy. Yes. Like Kevin Amos type of energy, like these, these uh, Matt, Matteo Rizzo, they have like this it factor, this performance factor where they can light up the arena where we don't have so much of that in the women's event. I was actually, I know that Luna is supposedly dating Brandon Frazier or they had a tour romance. And if that continues, I would be curious if she spent time with Raph, like if that would give her some grown up energy to be in California, like Maybe. away from her family and kind of come into her own in that sense, or at least spend time there uh, for a couple of months to see what could happen. Um, I think that Skate Canada is more interesting for me, for the women. We have um, Sarah Maude Dupuy, uh, Kai Ruder, and Maddie Skizas. So we have Maddie and Kaya going against each other, I think is really interesting because Kaya really has shown glimpses of coming on strong. What is your take that? Well, Kaya is more consistent. Yes. Um, she gets like some of the calls sometimes on her jumps. And I think that the area that Kaya needs to improve the most on is her spins. She's often losing levels and getting the Vs and the quality. It's not as many like plus four, plus three, plus four, plus five type elements in the spins. But um, I think that Maddie also needs to revamp mm -hmm. a lot of her, her skating. Um, she seemed to have kind of lost her little, her sparkle, her competitive spark that was so strong during the Olympic season last year. Um, whether that was because of exhaustion or, or something else, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think that they both have different strengths right now. Kaya is more consistent, which under pressure could lead itself to better results. Um, I don't know like what Maddie's done in terms of like her programs or working on maybe with like a mental trainer. I don't know, but um, those were areas that she definitely would have needed to address. I thought last year some of her skating skills could have, you know, definitely been addressed. Uh, she is coming off and spins. Like I talked about spins yeah. for Kaya, but Madeline also one of her weaker elements is is her spins. And I mean, you can triple lutz that combo spin. You can get as many points as a triple lutz on a level four combo spin. You have to milk those spins. And when you're not, you're losing like a point on one spin, a point on another spin, a point on another spin. It adds up. I'm curious to see if there's going to be a little bit of a change after tour, because sometimes when skaters do so many shows, they come back a little bit more confident for the next yep. season and they have yep. that little extra zest. I agree. Uh, we have Nicole Schott, uh, Laurie Naki Gutman, Rika Kihira, where we haven't heard or seen her for a long time. So I'm hoping that she is healthy. Last season, I really enjoyed- well, we saw her last year, but I haven't heard like what's going on. Yeah, she's not doing any of the shows in Japan right now. So I've been- Maybe it's because she's in Toronto training. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. So, um, Kauri Sakamoto, I think, uh, Rinka Watanabe, Chao Yun Kim, Star Andrews, who she's been in the hospital recently, and we haven't had any updates there, uh, Audrey Shin, and Lindsay Thorngren. So, I think that it's, it's Kauri's event to win or lose, but I think that there's some interest. Uh, I think it'll be more also how Kauri competes, her consistency, what her programs look like compared to the girls that were at Skate America the week before. I agree. Uh, in France, we have uh, Nina from Belgium. Um, there is Jana from Finland, uh, Leah from France. We have uh, Gubanova, Monachiba, Wakaba is back. So I'm really excited. Um, Rion uh, Simiyoshi, Haiyan Lee, uh, Kimmy Rapond, and Isabeau Levito. So there's like four or five skaters right there. I'm definitely excited to see Wakaba. She was missed last season. And also interest, I, I agree. I like Wakaba's energy in her skating. Um, also that the Isabeau and Ilya have kind of chosen the same strategy doing two earlier events, um, yeah. giving themselves a nice window of time, like I said, with Ilya to, to make necessary changes or whatever needs to be done to get ready should they make the Grand Prix final or like for the second second half of the season. So I think that that's pretty smart. Yeah. It is a little worrying if Isabel will make the final because she's against Kimmy Rapond, who is was consistent last year. Very although, consistent. You know, like the skaters change right from season to season. She but was very consistent, though. You're right. Ian Lee, I think, is and Kubanova are definitely two skaters. And at Skate America, I think she would have to really look out for Monica Wabe maybe Nini from China and Luna Hendricks uh, as potential uh, skaters that could 
you know, really challenge her. So I don't, you know, getting the amount of points, she's at two of the more stacked fields. So uh, four cup of China, we've got Luna, Maddie Skizas, three TBDs, Nina Petrokin at Mai Mihara, uh, Rinka Watanabe, Hana Yoshina, uh, Yilim Kim, Audrey Shin, and Brady Tunnell. Actually, one of the better fields in China. Yeah, that is a, a good field. And we don't even know who China's going to send. Yeah. Going back, like, I feel like I talk about China's TBDs so much, but yeah. another reason that they could keep the TBDs is they were, they were looking to see which one of their skaters were going to be picked up from other countries. Yeah. And then you look like who got spots from other countries and who didn't, who got one event when you thought that they were going to get two somewhere else. So you have to name them to Cup of China to get their second one. Like a lot of things like that, that may be why China's chosen to keep these TBDs. Well, Finland has three uh, at their host event, again, just like China. Then we have uh, Lorene Schild, Monica Wabe, Kauri, uh, Rion Subiyoshi, Chaim Kim, Young Yu, Kimi Rapan, Star Andrews, and Amber Glenn. So one of the better, I think it's time for Amber to really step it up, but hopefully after having some more exposure last season, she's really in that spot. And then at NHK, it's Nina from Belgium, Kubanova, Nicole Schott, uh, Wakaba, Maimi Hara, a TBD, Yilin Kim, Haiyan Lee, Seong Wee, uh, Lindsay Von Zunder, Brady Tunnell, and Lindsay Thorngren. So that is a really stacked field at NHK. He always is for, for the ladies in the men's event. Um, interesting choice for Kaori not to do NHK. Yeah. Um, seen as she is the world champion that's in her home country. I understand the issue though, because the Grand Prix final is back in China. So you know, it's a it, well for her, Japan to China is not that bad, but for some of the Japanese skaters that train overseas, that's a lot to go all the way to NHK, come back for one week, and then go to China for the final. Like, I can see the burden with that, but interesting choice from her that she doesn't want that event because she would have had the choice as world champion four, she put in her selection. Four of her potentially biggest competitors, Wakawa, Mai, Yelim, and Hai and Lee, all Are have there. to go from NHK to the final. So, yeah. That could be a really smart strategy. But we're looking like the Korean girls and the Japanese, like they're so close already. It's not like coming back to Toronto or going back to like New York or something like that. Maybe she's in it to win it for the final. Yeah. Maybe this is her. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, Dave, I'm going to give you my five minute call because Bruno yes. has to go to the rink because we have like an abundance of Japanese teams right now at the rink. People so want to know, what do you go. think about pairs? You know, what, yeah. What is your take on the pairs for this season? <laughs> I hope that we're going to see a lot of these, these new teams and these teams that kind of broke through onto the scene last year because of the opportunities with having, um, you know, this, this ban on the Russian skaters. I hope that we're going to see them really now step up their game in terms of their, their performance and choreography selections and in terms of technical elements. I hope that we are going to see a big step up and we're going to see many pairs challenging each other, not just like a few of them right at the top sprinkled around the top. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the Italian pairs develop. You know, the Olympics are going to be in Italy. They have such a big push from there. All the Italian tip pairs appeared strong. The field is deep. So I think now it'll be really interesting. Now they at least have another spot for Worlds. Um, but there's still so many of them sprinkled around um, events. How about Trent and Leah? I'm expecting big things from them. Um, they're going to Skate America. Skate America is one of the harder events um, on paper for pair skating. And it, it doesn't have those two American teams listed yet. But um, I, I have high hopes for them. I think that if they can build on what they did last season, they are going to be big medal contenders going into Worlds in Montreal. I think it's going to come down to having better material. Of course, last season they had first year pair team material. That happens. I completely understand it. Um, and maybe like taking their strengths, like they're both great single skaters. Maybe they can collect some points by upgrading even more of their jumps. Um, and I'm that's a team I'm really looking forward to seeing. What do you think of all the new pairs? You well, know, like we, I said, I hope that we see them yeah. all step up their game um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of every aspect of, of skating. And we see a lot of challengers because like on paper right now, without Alex and Brandon on the Grand Prix circuit, Riku and Ryuchi are kind of like floating at the top mm -hmm. alone um, unless they skate really terribly. And that's not great for the sport and it's not great for them. They need to be challenged as well. So I'm that's why I was like mentioning like the Japanese are the... Italian pairs. We have Peng coming back with her new partner, Wang. 
what are they going to be like? They were both really, really great in previous teams. So this is a potential team from China that could kind of like escalate to the top pretty quickly right now. So I'm looking forward to the development of them as well. And like maybe seeing like some type of video appear before the Grand Prix. Are they going to compete at a senior B maybe? Like who knows with the Chinese skaters what's going to happen. Yeah, and dance, it's super interesting because I think there are a lot of teams that need to kind of move. And then we have the old guard of Chalk and Bates and Gillis and Poirier and Guinard and Fabri. And are the young ones really going to start challenging them? Because we don't have that dominant team like Papadakis and Cicero. Yeah. So there's a lot of... We could have like some shifting results throughout the season, which I think is is great for the sport and for ice dance. Yeah, and I think Hawaii and Baker coming back um, is exciting to see how um, they do. Fear and Gibson moved, you know, up so uh, heavily. But the Cana Danes, you know, uh, Laurence Fournier-Baudry and Nikolai Sorensen were really kind of the team of the season last year. Uh, and many So of much will come down to material. Yeah. So much is going to come down to material. And we have not a clue in dance so this is uh but we know it's the 80s for the rhythm dance so i'm excited for that but you know i'm old so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> i think that's going to be really fun actually um mm -hmm. especially because like that's like our generation but it's not necessarily the generation of the skaters that are skating right now so it's going to be really fun to see how they can tap into that plus the 80s were campy skating is campy i yeah, think it's i think it has a lot of potential i was not a fan of of the short dance last season, but I think that this year is going to be a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much for coming on to discussing our tradition of the Grand Prix assignments and enjoy your camping trip. Thanks so much, Megan. Thank you. Bye, everyone.